our Center for Cognition, Language, and Law is really quite remarkable and uh, really does a great job at combining, blending, blurring the lines between academic theory, practice, uh, and, and research. And it does it in a global sense. And this center has been remarkable for programs that it's run, one on authorship authentication, which I thought was particularly fascinating, and then this year uh, involved with programs on false confessions, forced, conf I always get this wrong, forced confessions and false convictions, two different programs. Um, and uh, these issues are uniquely addressed here by uh, people who are linguists, studying language in universities, students and faculty alike, and law faculty, especially their own law faculty. I think you're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, and also we have uh, for the program, one of the, and this is no bullshit, leading linguists in the world, our own professor, Lawrence Solon, and a guy who tolerates no BS because he brings an egg timer to faculty meetings uh, and manages to keep, it's true, I'm not making that up, right? He dearly does it. And he has run the faculty meetings in probably the most efficient effective manner that anybody has done in any law school, in history, anywhere, and that's no hyperbole or BS, uh, at Professor Adam Colber. So I think you're uh, due to have a real treat tonight and a very thoughtful program. Um, I'm running off not because I'm afraid of being called on as an expert or used as an example uh, but because my privacy law class, it started at 6 o'clock, has been running itself for now eight minutes. And I think I better get down there. So have a wonderful evening, uh, and I hope that you have the experience we expect you to have. Professor Solon, over to you. I really am a linguist. And there's a significant literature in uh, linguistics and psychology and the philosophy of language about um, different species of dishonesty. And if you look at um, the um, ethical rules and some of the procedural rules and some of the criminal statutes, and then you look at the taxonomy of dishonesty that the linguists and others have developed that is somewhat more subtle than what you usually say in everyday life, you're going to find that it's not the case that all dishonesty in law is barred all the time. Some dishonesty is barred almost all the time, and some dishonesty is tolerated um, more than one might expect. And I started exploring that and writing about it, and I thought I would share some of that um, with you now. Um, there are ethics CLE credits for this program because learning not to lie so much is something that's considered an ethical matter. So. Oh, and I, and I was asked to read this about, after the program ends, please hand in your evaluation to Matilda Garrido at the registration desk. You will receive your CLE certificate at that time. Please hand in your evaluation form before you proceed to the reception. So I cannot take advantage of your drunkenness to get better um, <laughs> evaluations, and I, you know, I, I know that in advance, so it's fair enough. Well. The, the goals of the presentation are to distinguish among these three species um, of, um, of dishonesty, lying, deceit, and bullshit. The, um, the, the, the Brooklyn Law School asked me just to, to, to use the initials so that we didn't get in trouble on the internet. And in fact, they really asked me just to call it B, but I said, no, you have to put the S in also. <laughs> Um, we're going to examine the ethical and legal ramifications of each, determine whether the law distinguishes among them properly, and discuss whether the system provides the right tools for judges uh, to deal with in, um, dishonest conduct in court. That's what we're going to be looking at. And if it's not a lie, what is it? Well, lying is saying something you believe to be false when you believe that people hearing it will believe that you're telling the truth. So it's all about your own belief as a speaker. We'll get to that in a little, little later. Deception is saying something you believe to be true, 
um, or false, really, this is a little bit too narrow, in order to influence those who hear it to believe something you believe to be false. So deceiving somebody is really about getting them to believe something. Lying is about what you think. Oh, that's even better. Thank you. Can I just take your, thanks. Um, so um, one of them is speaker-oriented, and the other is hearer-oriented. And thirdly, a BS is saying something without concern as to whether it's true or false in order to create one or another impression. So those are the Hannibal Lecters of, um, of, of um, speech acts. So we're going to first talk about lies. Now tell me whether you think this is a lie. Superfan has got tickets for the championship game and is proud of them. He shows them to his boss who says, listen, Superfan, any day you don't come to work, you better have a better excuse than that. Superfan says, I will. On the day of the game, Superfan calls in and says, I can't come to work today, boss, because I'm sick. Ironically, Superfan doesn't get to go to the game because the slight stomach ache he felt arising, on arising turns out to be tomain poisoning. So Superfan really was sick when he said he was. Did Superfan lie? This is from an article. So let's see what you think. On a scale of one to seven, where one is, that's a real whopper of a lie, that's a one. Two is, well, I call it a lie, but it's not the most prototypical lie. Three is, it's barely a lie. Four is, I don't know what this is. <laughs> Five is, it's not a lie, but it's pretty damn close. Six is that it's, it's not a lie, and, it's, and, it, and, and, and it's, it's a bit of a distance. And seven is, come on, that was a truthful statement. Okay, one is the worst. Who gives it a one? Two. Three. Four. People are raising their heads very briefly like they're in an auction house. <laughs> so some people don't know. Five, six, seven. So other than six, we have instantiations all the way from one to seven as to whether that's a lie. And just imagine what would happen if you had to roll the dice to see whether your judge was a one or a seven. <laughs> with respect to something that your client said or somebody else. So we seem not to be in a, in a court. Here, here's another one. This, is, this one's kind of Clinton-esque. John and Mary have recently started going together. Valentino is Mary's ex-boyfriend. One evening, John asks Mary, have you seen Valentino this week? Mary answers, Valentino's been sick with mononucleosis for the past two weeks. Valentino has, in fact, been sick with mononucle mononucleosis for the past two weeks, but it's also the case that Mary had a date with Valentino the night before. Did Mary lie? Okay, one is that was a real lie. Seven, it was a real not lie. Ready? Go. One. Yeah, we have some real moral people here. <laughs> I'm related to one of them. Two. <laughs> Three. Four. Right in the middle. Five. No fives again. Oh, do five? Oh, good, good, thank God. Six, seven. Yeah, because if you, so people have very different conceptions of what's a lie and what's not a lie. So the classic definition that you see in the law, which it really has to be something you believe to be false, um, that's really something that not everybody agrees upon. And one of the reasons you don't agree upon is this is really as bad as telling a false statement. I'm sure some of you feel so some of you probably were thinking, well, I know it doesn't really look like a classic lie, but I hate to call it not a lie because this is a really bad thing to have done. And that's in particular the case if Mary kissed John, uh, kissed Valentino, and then infected John with mono the next day. And, and I, I believe she actually did. <laughs> well, the perjury statute talks about, this is the federal perj perjury statute, and it talks about, um, about somebody testifying that's uh, swearing that they're going to tell the truth, but willfully and contrary to such oath, states or subscribes to any material matter which he does not believe to be true. So number one, it only matters what you believe. You're not saved by the truth under the perjury statute if, if you read it as a textualist. Because if you really think that you're lying, then that's good enough to be convicted of perjury. Number two, it accepts white lies. We'll talk about white lies a little later, because it has to be material. And material means that it's important enough to be something that convinces people of, of um, whatever it is you want to convince them of. So when the, the classic thing about people being allowed to lie about their age 
Um, if you lied about your age, but it has nothing to do with whether you were at Cleveland at the time of the fraud, then you know that that's not perjury. I always pick Cleveland. And then the, the classic case um, of perjury was decided in the 1970s. It's the Bronston case. Bronston filed for bankruptcy. He was a film producer, and in, in, in fact, um, he he he. he he filed for voluntary bankruptcy, and then he was asked this question under oath at the examination of the debtor, Did you have any, do you have any bank accounts, in, any accounts in Swiss banks, Mr. Bronston? No, sir. The company had an account there for about six months in Zurich. Well, that was true, but it was also true that he had bank accounts in Zurich. So he was prosecuted for perjury and, this, and, and convicted. And the case went up to the Supreme Court, and they reversed nine to nothing. They said that it was really up to the lawyers to ask the additional questions. He gave a non-answer. He didn't give a false answer. But obviously, he gave a truthful non-answer that was intended to get the questioner to believe something to be true that he believed to be false. So it's classic deception but it wasn't a lie with respect to the perjury statute. And that basically is the law here. And anybody who litigates and has given their clients or other witnesses instructions, don't help them at all. But you can't lie. That's what they're talking about. This level of deceit is tolerated in the courtroom. It's not tolerated in many other places in American society. So as those here, Paul Gangs is here, you teach business law. You certainly, you can't tell your students that it's okay in the middle of a deal to tell people something that will convince the other side of the transaction that something is true that you know to be false because that's a, that's a fraudulent activity. So that level of fraud is tolerated but almost only in the courtroom as far as um, American law is concerned. And the idea was, you know, the, the, it's, in some ways it's reasonable because the lawyers are there. They're not asking questions in the most neutral, dispassionate way. They're asking questions in a way to frame situations, to get the witnesses to concede, to some, concede that something's true that may be true but an unfair way to characterize it. And the witness tries to dig in and play the same game and the lawyer gets to raise his or her fees if they succeed why should the witness go to prison for doing exactly the same thing? Um, when I practiced law I, and I had a paralegal with me at trial, she was in charge of bringing chocolate. So at the low blood sugar moment, I wouldn't have a Bronston experience if I could, if I could avoid it, because it is very easy to miss something like that when somebody's trying to deceive you. Um, and that's a quite a low standard, and, and people in philosophy criticize the legal system for having such a low standard for perjury. And it's not entirely true. So if you say, how many children do you have? I have two daughters. Well, what if I also have a son? Did I lie? Do you have a Chevy? I have a Ford. I need a dollar for a Coke. How much money do you have? I have a dollar. Well, what if I have $126 in my pocket? <laughs> Among them is a $1 bill. I don't think anybody would think I'm lying because the purpose of the question is to see whether I have at least a dollar so that my friend could buy a Coca-Cola. But for the others, it's a, little, it's, it's a little more iffy. And the law seems to have moved, not, not that the, the, the Supreme Court said nothing else, but the Federal Circuit Courts have moved in a direction of saying that if you couldn't guess from the beginning that the question was intended to adduce something other than what the answer was, then it's perjury even if it's truthful. And so um, the, the, the the leading case in this is the Sixth Circuit case. Okay, in 1990, oh, I'll tell you, the, I'll tell you this, the facts. This, this, um, there was a Preakness party. Uh, the Preakness is, is the, the famous horse race um, in May and in, on a, with respect to people on a military base. And, that, and, and one of the officers was soliciting political campaign contributions from lower ranked members of the base at that party, and that's a crime. You're not allowed to do that. So there was an investigation, and somebody in, at the party who was loyal to the defendant, was, and a guy named Dazarn was asked, OK, in 1991, and I recognize this is the period that you were retired, he held the Preakness party at his home. Were you aware of that? Yes, sir. 
Yes, okay, sir, was that a political fundraising activity? Absolutely not. And it wasn't because the party was really in 1990. The lawyer just made a mistake. But the whole context showed that they were talking about that party in 1990. And they convicted and upheld the conviction of Desarn for perjury because he understood the question as asking about 1990, even though the lawyer said 1991. So the notion is that if you understand the question, you have to give an answer that's not a lie with respect to your understanding of the question, or literal truth doesn't even help you. Um, but if you, if you give a totally non-responsive question and you can tell that it's non-responsive, then you're not a perjurer. What a distinction. I don't think any, any, any moralist, uh, you know, um, is, is, you go to any church or mosque or synagogue or anything, nobody's going to tell you that's how you should behave. That's how you should draw the lines. But that is the law. May lawyers lie? Next. <laughs> and this is the um, ethical rule. You're really not allowed to lie, and the judges really don't like it when lawyers lie to them. It's, it, it really is a, a, um, a delict. <laughs> um, can anyone else lie? Not really. You're really not supposed to lie. Um, and, um, but sometimes there are, there are exceptions. Police officers working under the supervision of prosecutors may lie in the course of an investigation. We know that. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody besides me has seen um, Making a Murderer. It's, it's, it's some little thing that hasn't been mentioned in the press. Um, and uh, testers in civil rights cases are allowed to lie. The, you know, they, they've been, um, those who, um, you know, defendants have said that this, these people posed as a couple looking for an apartment and they really weren't a couple, so therefore my client should not be um, liable for violating the civil rights laws. And the answer is yes, they are. Um, and uh, there's a controversy um, over um, a police testimony because there are times where um, police officers um, say that their search was, um, was within the Fourth Amendment um, um, limitations, but it probably wasn't. And the judges um, seem to think, well, that's, you know, that's okay because, the, because they have to work with these people all the time and so on. So there are informal ways in which lying is permitted and there are ways in which there are actual judicial opinions that it's permitted, but typically not by the lawyers themselves. It typically has to do with people working under the lawyer's supervision, and that's also the rules say that you can't do that. You, you know, you can't say, well, I'm not allowed to lie in court, so I'll hire you to lie in court, but, the, um, but there are these kinds of exceptions for, you know, in circumstances like this. Now I'm gonna switch to deceit and we have plenty of time, that's good. Um, Adam's going to comment in a, in a bit. And this is, this is um, Rule 10b-5 of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And it is a, um, it, it's, an, it's an unlawful act, and look at B, to make any untrue statement of a material fact or to omit to state a material fact necessary in order to make the statements made in the light of the circumstances under which they were made not misleading. Well, that's really quite different. That's saying once you open your mouth, you have an obligation not to cause somebody to believe something to be true that you believe to be false, even if you don't lie. And that really is the basic business standard. So we actually have a reduced standard of honesty in the courtroom than in the business world. Uh, we'll get to some other nuances uh, a little bit later. What happens if you don't believe something's false because you don't even care whether it's true or false? We'll get to that when we talk about Donald Trump. <laughs> um, before that, we'll have some other celebrities um, <laughs> to deal with. So lies are about, as I mentioned earlier, lies about what the speaker said. The statement must be intended to be false. Deception is about what the hearer understood whether or not the statement is true or false, both require mens rea. That is, it's, it's surely not the case that if you accidentally say something that is um, not true, believing it to be true, that just means you made a mistake. That doesn't mean that you committed perjury. So there are mens rea requirements for, certainly for criminal fraud. Um, there is, um, with respect to, um, with respect to civil fraud cases and misrepresentation, it varies depending on the use. In contract law, 
Innocent misrepresentations can allow for contracts to be canceled if they're material, because if you told somebody something that's not true and contracts is basically a strict liability legal regime, it, it really doesn't matter so much whether you did it on purpose or not if they made the deal based on the false representation that you made. But you probably didn't commit a tort. You probably only um, got somebody into a contract that they can, that they can um, abrogate. Now we also assume sincerity when we hear the speech of others, which is one of the reasons that we have these um, strong scriptures against, um, against fraud, against um, any kind of misrepresentation, because we assume when somebody, we have a right to believe people. And the law imposes the burden of sincerity on them, so even if they're insincere, what they say counts as being sincere. Threats, insincere threats are crimes because people have the right to believe them to be sincere. So if somebody holds you up at an ATM machine, they can't later say, well, I really never would have shot you. <laughs> and even if they use a water pistol, they're still guilty if you, would, if, you were, if you reasonably were frightened by what you heard. Because you have a right to believe them. Promises, insincere promises form binding contracts unless it was unreasonable to believe what, was, what went on in the, in the negotiations. Um, and um, and there's, there's, there's quite a legal literature on including a book called Insincere Promises. False or misleading statements are both tortious and criminal if relied upon in ways that I just talked about. Now, here's a philosopher. <laughs> A guy named Searle, they named half of the California universities after this guy. Um, in cases where one dissociates oneself from one's speech act, meaning like lawyers, so <laughs> lawyers, military people, people where you're speaking on behalf of somebody else and you don't really want to take, you don't have to take full responsibility for believing what you said, it is as if one were mouthing a speech act on someone else's behalf, the speaker utters the sentence, but dissociates himself from the commitment of the utterance. So how much can lawyers um, hide behind that veil? That's the question that we're going to get to right now. Well, quite a bit. So a lawyer is allowed to make a, to put on a false defense in a criminal case. Not in Canada, by the way. So if you're a criminal lawyer and you enjoy doing that, stay right here in the United States of America. Um, so Jerry Shargell, who's a friend of this law school, he's a graduate and he teaches here sometimes and he's, he, he's, he's a personal friend of mine as well, says a trial may be a search for the truth, but I as a defense attorney am not part of the search party. I think it's a great lie. <laughs> he says there are lots of ways of making a living, but this isn't one of them if you don't want to take the evidence and do what you can with it on behalf of your client. So you can't lie. You can't put on a fraud, but you can try to um, adduce enough evidence so it's possible to characterize that evidence in a way favorable to your client, even if you believe that the story, the, the narrative that the evidence is consistent with didn't happen. And even if you know it didn't happen, that's really where the Canadians differ. So if your client says, I did it, but I want to have a defense, because I'm gonna, there's, it's not gonna do me any good to plead guilty, I'm gonna go away for so long, that that happens, then the uh, lawyer has um, every, not only a right, but perhaps an ethical obligation to put on a false defense, as long as they don't lie. So there are these um, well-known um, parables. Here's, here's a, a story that def from Monroe Friedman. A defendant has been wrongly identified as the criminal but correctly identified by a nervous elderly woman who wears eyeglasses as having been only a block away five minutes before the crime took place. If the woman is not cross-examined vigorously and her testimony shaken, it will serve to corroborate the erroneous evidence of guilt. And the answer is not only should you vigorous, can you vigorously cross-examine that woman, but you should go into a different profession if you don't want to. I mean, you just, you just, if, you, if you don't want to, if you're not gonna do it, if you, you have to do it. Um, and he, le he made it easy because it really doesn't matter whether your client's guilty or innocent as to whether you should do that. A coroner's report contains several errors in calculating the time of death that is being at 10 o'clock. The lawyer, in fact, knows the time of death to be 10 o'clock because his client told him. Should the lawyer cross-examine the coroner vigorously to discredit the report? Yes even knowing that his goal is to get the jury to believe something to be true that he knows to be false or she knows to be false. 
And lawyers, good lawyers know how to, you read any trial manual, any, any trial practice manual, and you are told to be conversational, both with the jury and the witnesses. What's this conversational business? It's so that people will let their guards down enough that they won't know that you're trying to get them to accept a characterization of what happened that they wouldn't accept if they kept their guard up, for example. So a lawyer asks an opposing witness to a degree to a characterization. The lawyer intentionally makes the question sound like it's just plain English. Should the lawyer disclose that the words are legally powerful? So wouldn't you agree that this is a such and such, and that turns out that if they do agree to it, it's going to help the lawyer's client. And you really wouldn't call it that if you're just being fair. On the other hand, the lawyer's job isn't to be fair. The lawyer's job is to get the characterization, to get the admission so that their client will succeed. You're more likely to get the, the, that admission by getting the, the witness to let down their guard and to let down their guard if you, if, if you talk in a certain tone of voice. And good lawyers know how to do that. They know how to be conversational. They know how to get people to relax enough so that they, they will, um, you know, that they'll be off guard and, 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 um, and admit to things. And, and this one, you know, this is, you know, I begin by telling you that you are the most important people in this room. Wait until you read the literature on how to deal with juries and expert witnesses. They're all idiots. You can't talk, pay any attention to the jury. You have to do this. You have to do that. So there's, you know, the, and, and that's perfectly fine also. Now, <laughs> we're going to talk about the difference between lying and deceiving. Um, and, you know, and this was um, Clinton's lawyer. Yeah, this is his business was wonderful because everybody remembers that silly grin that Clinton had when he said that. <laughs> but the, but the, um, but the, um, what really happened was his lawyer said at the deposition, there was absolutely no sex of any kind in any manner, shape, or form with President Clinton, which was true at the time. It was a true statement. The prosecutor then was trying to get Clinton to admit that he had committed perjury by not correcting by, by overhearing his lawyer's true statement, although maybe it was misleading, maybe not, and not correcting it. That's the context in which Clinton said it depends upon what the meaning of the word is, is. And I practiced that grin for you, but I couldn't get it down, and I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> um, but you know, it, was, it, it wasn't a crazy thing for Clinton to say. It was just the, his being impressed with his own cleverness that was... Um, <laughs> And, and here, um, let's see this, and we've been having a little trouble with, oh, I, it's not a, let's see what we can do with this. Great. Uh-oh. I've never had sexual <laughs> relations with that woman, Monica Lewinsky. So, so that, this one we could do fine with. So. <laughs> These are false, and I need to go back to work for the American people. Thank you. You can applaud too. Um, <laughs> So this is an example of, of Clinton trying to use the Bronston defense along with his own definition of sex, and everybody remembers this quite well. Clinton was very careful. Clinton knew Bronston. I don't mean he knew Mr. Bronston. I meant he, he knew the case. <laughs> and um, the, um, you know, the, the firm I used to work at, and, and um, Lisa Finer from the um, AG's office was at that firm. That's where we first met. She's here. We represent, that firm represented Bronson in that case. Um, so um, this was him knowing the Bronson defense. Let's see what happens now when he's wearing a suit explaining, you know, everything that happened. Good evening. This afternoon in this room, from this chair, I testified before the Office of Independent Counsel and the Grand Jury. I answered their questions truthfully including questions about my private life, questions no American citizen would ever want to answer. 
Still, I must take complete responsibility for all my actions, both public and private. And that is why I am speaking to you tonight. As you know, in a deposition in January, I was asked questions about my relationship with Monica Lewinsky. While my answers were legally accurate, I did not volunteer information. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. That's enough of that. And the, um, <laughs> but you can see what he's, that, that's Bronston. That's saying that when I said I didn't have sexual relations, and I said these other things, I tried to walk the line of deceiving the questioners without saying anything false. And the reason I did it is because I believed that all of this was a political setup when they were unable to do anything with Whitewater after all of that, those months and expenditures, they went after this. And I wasn't gonna help them, but I was gonna stay on the right legal side. There are questions, and I've written about this and so have others, about whether he actually succeeded in that. Um, he was asked, um, did he um, ever, was he ever alone with her? And he, again, in, in, in um, honor of Mr. Bronston, said, well, there were times where she came over with a pizza, she brought a pizza. <laughs> well, you know, that's probably true. <laughs> um, but he also said, I don't know there were times, and of course he did know, so that much was probably false. Um, at any rate, that's really the line that he was trying to draw as a, as, as a person who wanted to avoid criminal liability. Um, people both laughed at him and feel, felt sorry for him, you know, when it was all done because they saw what he was trying to do. Um, again, he, um, he, he talks about his narrow definition of sexual relationships, and I believe that this is the definition that most ordinary Americans would give it, so if you're patriotic, you would um, agree with him. <laughs> all of this, again, in, in, the, in trying to draw the line between lying and deception. If you're a Democrat, you're going to be very happy soon, but not yet. <laughs> Um, so, um, and, and, and there are real issues. Um, if, you're, if, if we're together and um, you say you want, we're negotiating a deal with each other on opposite sides of the transaction, it's the, and you want to have a conversation with somebody named Hannes, it's the kind of conversation you would have only with Hannes in person if he's available. I would rather that you and Hannes not speak. You ask, have you seen Hannes recently? I answer truthfully, I saw Hannes in Washington last week. What I didn't add is that Hannes is now staying in New York, two blocks from where we're having our conversation, and I don't believe that I would be in any trouble for that. I think that if a judge heard it, the judge might think less of my position in the case, but I don't think there'd even be close to an ethical question for something like that. So in terms of negotiation for those people who are transactional lawyers or teach transactional law, there really are rules about how much you have to disclose, and there's a lot of fuzzy, blurry, gray in, in, in those areas. Now, here's, here's some um, hypotheticals that are that I think very uh, difficult and telling about all of this. A person saw a young man killed in a traffic accident just after speaking with him. The next day, he visits the victim's mother, who herself is old and dying. She asks how her son is. The witness to the accident should say, which of these three? He is alive and well. The mother's going to die soon. She may not find out. I saw him yesterday and he was alive and well. That's true. Your son is dead. So the question is, should you have to tell the absolute truth? Should you... Um, just say what you think would be the most comforting to her, or should you equivocate in a way that'll make you feel good about yourself? Who says number one? Just say he's alive and well. Who says number two? Oh, who said number one? Did we get one? one? Good for you. Um, who said number two? Almost everybody. Who says number three? You just gotta tell the truth. Yeah, so you know, that we have St. Augustine and Immanuel Kant on your side. <laughs> we'll get, to, the, we'll get to, we'll get to both of those lightweights a little later. <laughs> Um, and um, what I'm mostly interested in is not the difference between one and two on the one hand versus three on the other, because I think we all understand um, the difficulty in deciding whether to be truthful about the situation or not, and it's a moral question that we can apprehend even if we're not all agreeing upon it. It's really the, pre the prevalence over, of two over one. We feel better about ourselves when we don't lie even if what we do is say something that's equally deceptive, that, that, that has the same effect 
a de deceitful effect of getting somebody to believe something to be true that we know to be false. And we feel better about ourselves that way. And the law seems to feel uh, to be, um, in some instances, it draws the distinction, like in perjury. In common law fraud, it really doesn't. Um, but that's, that's sort of where people seem to draw the line. And lying is never OK from lawyers. So it, 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 um, we, we have some of that embedded in the law. Many moral philosophers say it's really no difference at all. And I, I, I tend to agree more with them. So um, one of my, um, I have some, some family members here. And my, my cousin Rob is here. He's a, a, a practicing lawyer in, um, in New Jersey. And we're cousins because our mothers are sisters. And we had another, and, and, and there were other sisters and, and who passed away. And one of them was our Aunt Bella, who was the nicest woman in the world. But she really was a, t she was not a good cook. <laughs> and you'd go stop over there, and you'd, you'd stop over for dinner. And she said, why don't you know, you'd stop over, so stay for dinner, and you would. And then you'd be eating, and it really was not an easy experience. And she would say, um, you know, how's the meatloaf? So, so delicious, that's what I would say. <laughs> Terrible. And, and I asked one of the um, administrators here at the school, and she said, well, couldn't you say, oh, well, it could use a little more pepper. Can't you like be um, you know, honest and critical, but still supportive? I don't think I could do that. The, the, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my position on all of this, oh, oh, here's Bush, sorry. <laughs> uh, the slides are slightly out of order, but my, my position um, on all of this is that it really shouldn't make much difference whether you're lying or deceiving. And if it's the kind of white lie that makes somebody feel good, I don't really think I'm a better person by saying unbelievable rather than delicious. Um, and I don't think that um, in Jennifer Saul, she's this um, philosopher that wrote the thing about the person talking to the mother of, the, of their friend that died. I, I mean, in her case, I don't really see any moral difference between uh, the, the two options there. Uh, lying and deceiving. Some people actually think the deception is more immoral because you've gone to concoct some story so you can feel virtuous by not telling a lie when you really know you're accomplishing the same deceptive end. So most of us in that case would be less moral. Most of us who would have taken that second option, which I would have as well. Um, so there's debate about all of this. Now here's George Bush. The British government has learned that Saddam Hussein recently sought significant quantities of uranium from Africa. Well, that's true, but what he forgot to mention is that most intelligence agencies around the world rejected that as nonsense um, because the, the documents were illegitimate. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a, also a, a Clinton-esque type um, deceptions so that you don't have to be responsible for having told a lie, but you can convince people that something is true that you believe to be false, or, or that you, I don't know what he believed, but, but certainly other people. So my position is that for any minimal pair, A and B, in which A is a false statement and B is a true statement, but, to, but a true but deceptive statement that successfully influences the hearer to believe A, A and B are morally equivalent. So to me, the perjury statutes, while they might have a reasonable procedural basis, um, really have uh, lack, lack moral strength as um, people outside the legal system believe them to. St. Augustine was really big on this stuff in, in early antiquity. And to use per speech for the purpose of deception and not for its appointed end is a sin. But then he realized, I mean, if we praised our Aunt Bella's meatloaf. You don't really want us going to hell. I mean, you were just kind of, we're, we were good nephews. So um, nor are we to suppose there's any lie that is not a sin because it is sometimes possible by telling a lie to do service to another. So it's a sin, but there were all kinds of ways of getting around it. And eventually the Jesuit tradition almost got to the point where if you said something and then you said not <laughs> to yourself, <laughs> That was almost good enough because the idea was to get people behaving as well as they could, not forgiving lies, but making it so that we really understand that, um, that, that people are doing their best in, in life. Or if you do your best in life, it's, it, 
even if, if, you, if, if you commit some kind of a sin, it's better than not doing your best. Yeah, a conscious thought all, that all lies are terrible no matter what, and deception is much better, and the murderer at the door was his parable. If somebody knocks on the door and wants to murder somebody in your house, you, and, and they're there, you, you, you can um, deceive them in some way, but otherwise you have to tell them the truth. Yes, he's in the living room. A lawyer is required to be truthful when dealing with others on a client's behalf, but generally has no affirmative duty to inform an opposing party of relevant facts. I remember being in the courtroom and saying, oh my God, I can't believe that they never saw paragraph four of this document, or I'd really be in big trouble in this case, and I was delighted. <laughs> a misrepresentation can occur if a lawyer incorporates or affirms a statement of another person that the lawyer knows is false. And, um, and these are all the comments. Misrepresentations can also occur by partially true but misleading statements or omissions that are equivalent of, I'm sorry, about, of, of affirmative false statements. Sorry about the typo. So um, they really try to create a relatively broad sense of what you can and can't do, but there surely are safe harbors. Um, and I think lawyers develop a, um, a working knowledge of what they are. This is totally untrue. A lawyer shall not engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. It should say a lawyer shall engage in that kind of activity, but only in the appropriate places. So if you can convince a witness to say something, or, um, or, or um, there's certain information you can withhold in a transaction because it's, it's on the right side of the line for those of people who develop a good sense of that, then you should do it false defenses in criminal cases, you should do it. So um, this is true as long as you contextualize it to what the law permits and doesn't permit. Um, but you can see that, the, I, I think this is a, a sincere statement that the, um, the drafters of the ethical rules um, feel this way as a general matter and, and, and let the rest of it sort of take care of itself and the, in, in, as exceptions. I'll just let you read this because it's, it's, it's um, summary. By the way, I'm writing an article with the title of this talk, which means that somebody will finally read something that I write because um, anything with that in the title, it will be engaged. Okay, now, now we're gonna talk about the third of these three ways of being deceptive, bullshit. <laughs> and, the, the idea for doing this comes um, from this book. This book, I, I, I own it, I should have brought it to, to my house. It's about, I don't know, 80 pages or something like that. It's in its 26th printing <laughs> from 2006. And um, Harry Frankfurt is a Princeton philosopher. I think he's emeritus now. Do, do you know him? He, he yes. is, right? He's emeritus? That's right. Yeah. And he, he took this position in this book, which is, I think, extremely interesting. The fact about himself that the bullshitter hides is that the truth values of his statements are of no central interest to him. What we are not to understand is that his intention is neither to report the truth nor to conceal it. It is impossible for someone to lie unless he thinks he knows the truth. Producing bullshit requires no such conviction. So this is the Hannibal Lecter of, of, of language. And um, let's, let's see him in action. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. The UK knows that they have weapons of mass destruction. Any country on the face of the earth with an active intelligence program knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Which could be activated within 45 minutes, including against his own Shia population. The choice is his. And if he does not disarm, the United States of America will lead a coalition and disarm him in the name of peace. So I, I think by the time these kinds of statements came that um, it really didn't matter whether it was true or not. This was the party line and um, it was more important to keep it up than it was to worry about what was true or false. Um, here's another one. Hey, I watched 
when the World Trade Center came tumbling down. And I watched in Jersey City, New Jersey, where thousands and thousands of people were cheering as that building was coming down. Thousands of people were cheering. So something's going on. We got to find out what it is. I do want surveillance. Now, this one's really pretty interesting because I think he probably believed it when he first said it. That is, there were videos of people in the Middle East cheering in not tens of thousands of people, but in some significant numbers. It also seems to be the case that they found three or four people together in Jersey City doing it. And it's, I can imagine that when he said that, he believed it was true and simply um, confused the stories and said it. It was only later that I'm talking about, because later when he defended it, it was pretty clear that it didn't happen. And I don't think he cared whether it happened or not. It was a pretty good metaphor for what he was talking about. And regardless of whether it happened or not, it stood for what people should be angry about and afraid of, and he just dug in anyway. And I don't think it made any difference to him whether it was true or false. So that is... And, um, you know, I thought I equivocate. I spent a lot of time thinking about Hillary Clinton because shortly after he said this, not this, but when he, when he started saying that Muslims should not be allowed in the United States, Hillary Clinton said that um, terrorists were using that statement by Donald Trump as, as fodder for recruiting um, more individuals into these various groups. And the various um, truth um, um, checking organizations couldn't find any examples of it. So I was gonna put that on too for the sake of, be, of, of you know, being even-handed about such things, but I, I realized that I think that when she said it, it was a little bit more that like what Trump, what, what Trump stated by when he said it the first time. That is, she just, she believed that if somebody's gonna say something not pro provocative, it's gonna provoke this kind of thing, and it probably has, and I could probably, and I could say it, and it would probably be verified. Now, you could criticize her, because if you're gonna be the President of the United States, or if you wanna be the President of the United States, and you're saying something happened, you really can find out. You have a staff of more than, you know, um, two teenagers that you hired as, you know, as high school assistants. Um, so, and, and so I'm not saying that that's a great thing to, to have done. The same way that Trump could have found out whether that really happened in Jersey City before he said it the first time. But I do believe that the initial statements by both of them were more negligent than fraudulent in the, in the first instance. So what if a prosecutor uh, charges an individual with crime, finds out later she could probably prove the case to a jury's satisfaction, but the defendant did not commit the crime? They're supposed to drop the case, and, um, and, and, you know, and they know this is a really terrible person? It's a hard thing to do, and sometimes they don't. And, it's, and that's actually trying to get somebody convicted of a crime by making statements. Um, they're not lies, but to make statements in court um, and, and not care about the truth or falsity of the narrative that they're putting on because they believe that there's a higher good pay uh, being served by, um, by pursuing the case. And this happens. It's the plot of making a murder depending upon who's guilty and who's innocent in that case. Common law fraud, depend in New York certainly, um, but also in some places, but not all places, um, um, punishes bullshit as well as deceit. So if made recklessly knowing that he had insufficient knowledge upon which to base such representation counts the same as making a deceitful statement. And, um, and, but not always. And it depends on being able to prove that they had enough knowledge. I said, what if you say, I didn't have, I, you know, I, or they, that they didn't have sufficient knowledge and they knew they didn't have sufficient knowledge. Well, I don't know, I thought this probably, yeah, I don't know, I, I, I thought this was, it's pretty hard to prove that somebody knew that they didn't know. So um, there's, there's kind of a safe harbor for bullshitting, and, um, and as I said, Harry Frankfurt says that's worse because it means that you don't care about the truth and falsity. We're, we're gonna finish up very soon. Um, this, this again repeats that in New York, um, saying things without caring about whether it's true 
if you know that you don't have enough information, is good enough to count as fraud. Now, um, for forensic experts, um, I think I'm going to um, push through most of this because I'd like to hear Adam Kolber's comments and then, and then your comments and your experiences in dealing with these kinds of issues. Um, but we see this kind of issue happening all the time in the world of Daubert and um, New York um, doesn't have the Daubert standard, still has the Fry standard, but nonetheless, we see judges very concerned about what happens in the expert context, and there's been a movement with the United States legal system um, taking the lead, actually, among legal systems in the world in requiring experts to, um, to have some kind of scientific basis for what they're saying precisely because a sci the scientific method should take the place of confidence that one is right even when one isn't. And even worse than that, of um, experts becoming team players. And I know that when I practiced law, I think I was pretty successful at getting my experts to constantly be reminded about how independent they should be, while also being reminded about how terrible the other side is. And, um, and by the time they testified, they believed themselves to be the most disinterested team players you possibly could be at the same time. And I sometimes am an expert now, and I see lawyers trying to play me the same way. Um, so I think it's very healthy in the world of scientific evidence for this kind of, um, this, th these, these kinds of considerations to be taken quite seriously with, um, with some problems, but in my opinion, um, quite a bit of progress in the last 10 or 15 years in, in wanting the legal system to do the right thing in this regard. So I think I'm, we'll, we'll skip the rest of this um, on um, experts. So what's the order of badness? Lying is a head-on affront to the truth, but at least the liar has to take more on legal responsibility for it. Deceit is a ploy to avoid responsibility for dishonest conduct. It's accepted in some situations. And BS is a carefree attitude towards the truth that shows no moral concerns at all, but doesn't always produce falsity. It's accepted even more, but may constitute fraud. So the, um, the philosophers tend to think that these are bad in reverse order. The legal system seems to be, say that they are bad in the, uh, the badness is in the order that they're listed here, and which um, all three show up in the courtroom, and you should be the judge. Thanks very much. I'm going to turn it over to Adam Colbert. Great. Well, thanks so much, Larry. Um, it's a rare opportunity that you can thank the speaker before you for all of their bullshit and mean it as a compliment. <laughs> so I thought I would comment on a couple things related to areas that I write on that, that touch upon your talk. So the first is about lying in another professional context, and that's medicine. So there's all kinds of research that suggests that giving people placebos can be quite effective for certain kinds of problems like pain. And placebos are cheap, and people don't get addicted to them. And um, so there might be an interest in using them more often, not just in medical experiments where they're used a lot, but also in clinical contexts where you'd be surprised how often they are used. Uh, there's been some recent data suggesting that. So this is kind of a gray area for doctors to do this. They have these obligations of informed consent. When can they use placebos? And so it's a little bit of a gray area. But several years ago, the AMA came out with some ethics opinions on it. And what they said is that um, they spoke they said it's really bad to, to use a placebo without the patient's knowledge. It may undermine trust, compromise the patient-physician relationship. And they said that physicians may use placebos for diagnosis or treatment only if the patient is informed of and agrees to its use. So, you know, if you have to agree to its use, I think it's going to be a lot less effective. You know, if the doctor says, oh, I see you've brought in that sandwich. Well, let me just sort of wave my hand around it, and now it will cure, your, it will cure, cure you of your pain. I don't think it's going to work so well. So I think the deceptive component really has an effect from a medicinal point of view. So now we can think about the different sorts of deception that Larry mentioned, and you could think about how effective they might be and how bad they are, either from a moral or a legal perspective. So one thing that the doctor could do is just lie, utter a false proposition knowing that it's false. So they could say, here, take this Valium, it will help you with your pain, and they're just giving the patient a sugar pill. That would be a clear lie, and it would violate the AMA's ethics opinion. Um, 
but it might work well. So, okay, so you might think about whether you think the AMA got this right. Now, something else they can do, when I bring this up with my students, they often ask, you know, could they, could they say, uh, here, patient, uh, lots of studies have shown that these pills are effective for the problem that you're having. Take one each day, okay? That I would think of as deceptive to the extent that you're not uttering a false proposition, but you're tr clearly trying to convey a false impression. We usually expect that when a doctor gives you a pill, it actually has some you know, specific effectiveness for your problem and not some generalized placebo effect. So I think we could imagine the lie version of it than the deceit version of it, which you might think of, again, there's the issue of whether that's better or worse. And then there's the bullshit version, which would be something like, you know, there, there's some new, you know, nutritional supplement or some St. John's wort that may or may not be effective, and the doctor doesn't really care whether or not it's effective because the doctor's trying to get a placebo effect. That might be the bullshit version. Now, just some thoughts on the lying versus the deception here. I do see the point that when you're lying, you, you're putting yourself on the line. You might get called out for it. Um, when you're deceiving, it could be tricky. So take the version where the doctor says, uh, here's a substance, so studies have shown that it will be helpful for your problem. Let's suppose this later gets unmasked somehow and the patient comes to the doctor and says, look, I looked this up and what's this obacalp, which is just placebo spelled backwards and there's a history of <laughs> doctors writing to the pharmacist obacalp when they want to give a placebo pill. Um, and the doctor has to come clean and say, well, you know, I didn't say anything that, to you that was false. All I said was that these pills are helpful for your condition. And in fact, were they helpful? Oh, they were? Okay. So, um, you know, there's the issue of trust, and you can ask partly what sorts of statements are more likely to defeat trust. And between the lying and the deception version, I'm not sure. I think maybe the, de the deceptive version might be less likely on the trust scale. But uh, anyhow, that's, that's something that some people may want to, to weigh in on, too. So another topic that I write about has to do with law and neuroscience, and you might be interested to know that neuroscientists are working on technologies to tell whether or not people are lying using brain technology. So there's a history of using polygra polygraphs, and a lot of people think they're not good enough for the courtroom. These kinds of brain-based techniques, putting people in scanners, using fMRI, they're probably not good enough yet either, but the potential is there that they someday will be good enough. So some of these studies will be on college students. They'll report things like 90% accuracy. They'll tell a person, they'll give them a playing card and they'll tell them to, be dis to lie about it in the scanner and they'll try to see how accurate they can get. Um, and they can get numbers on the order of 90% accuracy, but if you introduce countermeasures, way to ch ways to cheat the scanner, then the scanners don't do so well. So it's really something that could be more interesting in the future, but it's important now because, for a few reasons. So one reason it's important now is that you may need to regulate technologies even before they're really effective enough to be used in a courtroom or maybe even before they work at all. So there are already a couple of companies that have tried to sell these lie detection services. So there's a company by the name of No Lie, M no lie MRI that will offer to say, you know, you, you, you bring in your husband, you say, oh, I think he's been cheating on me, do this test, and they will charge money for this. So there's just a question of regulating the technology even if you don't think it works. And then the issue is, well, what should courts do about it because cases may come to the court even before we think the technology works so well, and there have been a couple of cases. One was tried here in Brooklyn. It was an employment discrimination case where a temp worker said that someone sent her a sexually offensive photo, and she complained about it, and she later said she was retaliated against by her temp company, that they weren't giving her assignments, and um, they wanted to offer this fMRI evidence from one of the witnesses to say that he was telling the truth, in that case, the court said it wasn't admissible, and they focused on the issue of lie detection being the province of the jury. That was the main focus, and that's an interesting issue because that suggests, what if we got really good technology, right? Would we still want to say, no, 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 the lie detection is for the jury to do? I'm not so sure. I think if we really had good technology, we might want to use it, but to the extent that the case relies on the province of the jury argument, it's not obvious how that technology would come out. And of course, they also just briefly mentioned the view that they didn't think it was scientifically accurate enough, but that wasn't where they focused the opinion. Then there was a Sixth Circuit case called SEMRAO that was about a psychologist who had used billing codes that were not the proper billing codes, and he was accused of healthcare fraud, and he claimed that these were sort of innocent mistakes, that he wasn't doing anything 
to deliberately be deceptive, that it's very complicated, which is true, and he wanted to introduce fMRI evidence from another company called Cephos to show that he was um, being honest, basically, when he said that, he, that none of this was intentional. And so in this case, the court really does work through a lot of the scientific evidence, and to be honest, it's not super impressive uh, in that particular case, and ultimately it's, it's, it's deemed to be inadmissible. So that's where the current state of this is, but the technology is getting better, so it's something worth following to see, you know, could this get better? In fact, there was a recent study not using fMRI, but just using trial transcripts and coded, gesture, coding, coded information revealing gestures during trials, and they fed this information into computers to try to figure out when people were lying, and they had a database of cases where they believed they knew the truth. And they claim that their computer system was more accurate than humans. It was something on the order of about 75% accurate, where humans were something like 65% accurate. So um, that's been published as conference proceedings, and we'll see, we'll see where that research goes. But that's interesting, too. In other words, we might not necessarily need fancy brain scanners to, to do this if the technology gets good enough. By the way, this technology doesn't seem to distinguish this fMRI stuff. People haven't distinguished well between lying, deceit, and bullshit. I think most of the research on college students is, tech, is testing clear lies. Like they know they're uttering something that's false or clicking a button that they know is false. Um, but it'd be interesting to see if they'll ever get good enough to try to distinguish these different forms of deception. And the last reason why I think some of this matters now, even though the technology probably isn't good enough for most uses that we'd want to put it to at this point, has to do with what I call the technological look-back principle. Okay, So several decades ago, we didn't really have good DNA testing technology, and people left their DNA at crime scenes. They weren't especially worried about it because they didn't think it would ever be used to catch them. Decades later, that DNA evidence comes back to haunt them. Well, the same thing could happen with futuristic, more accurate brain scanning technology. So a few decades from now, we have a, very, a, 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 a lie detector that functions very well. It might be more accurate than juries, because of course, we don't know how good juries are. So there's kind of an unfair fight going on when we think about these new technologies. So imagine we have this good new technology, and they say, uh, in January 2016, you attended this talk by Professor Larry Solon, and afterwards, you claimed that you went to, you went right home and went to bed, um, but did you ever go to a strip club, or did you ever kill somebody, or did you ever do a whole list of these other things? And even though the, the questions may refer to events that happened decades earlier, this futuristic brain scanner might be quite accurate, in other words. If you really believe that there will be accurate brain scanners in a couple of decades from now, you have to think about your conduct right now because you never know when in the future you might be asked these questions. With those thoughts, I turn it back over for questions. Technically speaking, Supreme Court about 15, 20 years ago ruled on it in the, uh, um, the food lion case. But on the other hand, I guess if I called myself John Birch III and had gone in as a proto-activist to, to see the deceptive tapes going on, the left would think I'm, uh, I was a hero. Um, so is it Augustine, is it Kant, and how do you guys see that in the firmament of, of legal stuff? Well, could just say again exactly, they use the false li driver's license, right. is that right? So, for good. Yeah, but the so that was the deception yeah. was about his identity? Was that the only deception? I just don't know enough about the facts. Yeah, was that no, the only pertinent deception? The deception was, they, it was a, like a false instrument. Right. And you know, to, in order to get to the security yeah. to go into uh, Planned Parenthood. But they said, well, this is the only way we're going to find out the real dope on it. So it was just incidental right. to our higher purpose. Yeah. But then, presumably, if, if full line applies, even reporters can't do that, so therefore they fall down. But I think if, if the shoe was on the other foot, um, if I was going in there and calling myself John Birch III, 
to say, hey, you know, we doctored these uh, photographs and the, these tapes, but we were doing it for the greater good of yeah. uh, dead fetuses. Yeah, so uh, dead, I, yeah. I would just give an answer that may be too general for your interest to say it's always important to distinguish what are questions of morality, what are questions of law, and they're not always going to be the same. So some of Professor Solon's questions were about, you know, what should you tell the, the mother after the son dies? That's sort of a question of morality. That may raise different issues that when we think matter from a legal perspective. Now, your question might be a case where you think that their person's telling a lie, but if you, if you write that they have some greater good or they perceive themselves to have some greater good, you can just ask the question, in what cases are we morally or legally obligated to, or when are we morally obligated to follow the law? But I don't know a more specific answer. But rhetorically, if I'm a lawyer, uh, you think, uh, as a, as a private sort of representing, am I allowed to go to the brink in raising those arguments, even well, if the judge, well, at the top point, well, we get you notification, perhaps? Well, this, the, this, the, the issue there, of course, had to do with using false, using the government documents, right. namely the licenses, and it shows you how narrow and tenuous the tester cases are where the courts just reluctantly had to say, I don't know what you can do. You have this condo, this co-op that's never allowed a black person anywhere near the place, saying, what, what else are we going to do? So you're right that it's exactly, it, it's the same in that respect. And the fact that they're drawing lines with respect to the means of doing this as making sure that it stays totally private shows you how um, uncertain the legal system is about the question that you ask. lying to the FBI. And usually it's under an obstruction of justice charge. Uh, those lies, what is the standard of those lies compared to the standard of the perjury? You know, the, those lies are non-testimonial largely. Right. There's, there's a federal statute, section 1001 of the criminal code, that says that it's a crime in any matter within the jurisdiction of a federal agency to make us to, to knowingly make a false statement. So um, th there are prosecutions. There was a case, and I can't remember the name of it, but maybe somebody else here does, in which the um, the, the Supreme Court um, struck down the exculpatory no defense. So they knock on the door in the middle of the night of some union leader who had been a, done some had been done some crooked things many years ago, but the statute of limitations had run. It's like four in the morning. Didn't you do X 12 years ago? No. Now he's in prison because they said that um, you could always take the Fifth Amendment and you didn't have a right to defend yourself there. So there are times where the prosecutions are very aggressive with respect to that. There are very few prosecutions for oral statements because unless it's a real no and, 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 and there's, um, it's going to be very hard for somebody to deny it, it's almost all has to do with making, with, with statements in writing to agencies, false statements by companies, and so on. There was just a recent uh, verbal statement um, issue where somebody denied putting racist documents within a gov federal government office in Louisiana on the desk of somebody else, but it's, um, it's very rare, very rare prosecutions. But is that denial, even in writing, is that denial going to be evaluated by the same standard that the perjury denial is going to be? Yes. On the Bronson example that you gave with the, uh, on the Swiss <clears throat> bank, it seemed to me to be on all fours perjury. Do you have a Swiss bank account? The answer is no. That was true. But you said the Supreme Court uh, reversed oh. his conviction. Yeah, because it, he, 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 oh, do you have one? No, that was true. Did you ever have one? My company had one in Zurich right, for about six months. When he said no, there was. No, he didn't say no. If he, see, Clinton would have, would have, might have made a mistake and said, no, my company had one. Then he committed perjury. If you just say my company had one, and the hearer has, infers that that means no, my company had one, that's not perjury. So, no, my company had one in Zurich for six months is perjury. Simply, my p company had one in Zurich for six months is not perjury. That was the holding. Okay, I'm sorry, but I, I thought that your example was he did have a Swiss bank account, but lied about it. The answer, well, that did. At the t they first asked him, at this time, do you have one? And he said no, and that was truthful. Oh, all right. Okay? But, but, uh, let me ask you a second question, since I'm here. It strikes <laughs> me 
that. The distinction between lies and deception is really kind of a distinction without a difference, since both, both acts are designed to manipulate the hearer. You lie to him to get him to do or believe something, and you deceive him so that you could perhaps have deniability about the deception. So Bush says what he said, which is theoretic, technically not an absolute lie, but yet it is misstating material information to manipulate the hearer into an act which he wants them to do, right. which they would otherwise not do had they had the whole truth. So he's basically misstating material information. Well, look what happened here when we, when we asked what counts as a lie and what doesn't, and on a one to seven scale, we instantiated everything between one and seven. So um, on a moral basis, I agree with you, although not everybody does. On a legal basis, the law sometimes draws those distinctions and sometimes doesn't. And by the way, you can lie without deceiving anybody. You don't have to be, de you don't have to be successful in deceiving if you lie. So if, let's say it's important that I was in Cleveland on um, a particular date because then I couldn't have been doing something here in New York, and I say I was in Cleveland and nobody believes me. I didn't deceive anybody, and I committed perjury. <laughs> so whereas, um, but I didn't, you know, I'm not sure I committed a fraud. I mean, I, I tried. It's an attempted fraud, but I'm not really sure that it, you know, it didn't work. I'm not, I'm not good enough at it. <laughs> MRIs and uh, often you, men you mentioned that college students are often the subjects of these um, studies. Is there, is there, have you seen any literature that the ability to lie effectively may actually evolve over time? Uh, you know, m maybe college students are not an accurate um, representation of, of the capacity to lie because they haven't lived enough and they haven't uh, lied enough. That's interesting. There's definitely been a lot of scholar, scholarly commentary on the fact that college students are not good samples of the entire population. So um, the kinds of people we might want to use lie detectors on may be people who are you know, drug users, they have mental illness of various sorts. So absolutely, there's all kinds of ways that college students may be different. And um, so that at least scholars have commented on. I haven't heard anyone mention this particular issue about the ability to lie varying over time. Um, th interestingly, there is a lot of brain research about juveniles when it comes to juvenile justice and issues of responsibility, but on the lying part, I haven't seen that. We, we just had a program where Saul Kasson, who's um, a, 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 a psychologist, teaches at John Jay and Williams College um, and deals with false confessions and false convictions and so on. His experiments have college students trying to detect lies. By, they go into the prison and they say, well, can you tell the story of what landed you here? And most of them admit that, that what they did, and they tell the story. And they say, can you tell a story of the following crime that you didn't commit? Well, that's no problem. And then they ask the college students, can you tell the, you know, which of these is true? And there's half true and half false. And, you know, and, they, and they design who's hearing what you know, quite professionally. And the college students perform a chance. So then they ask police officers. They, they do the same thing because they're experienced. They do slightly worse. <laughs> so, uh, so it's interesting because we don't seem to get better at lie detection, although we seem to gain more confidence in our ability to detect lies, which, is, which really plays into what Adam's saying. I mean, you know, it's something worth caring about if we can get to the bottom of it. Absolutely. Because what does that say about jurors, of course? matter of fact and a matter of law and that, you know, if there's bad case law out there, you have an affirmative duty to correct it is my understanding. But if the judge were to ask you, uh, uh, you know, counsel, I'm going to assume this is your client's first brush with the law, you don't have an affirmative duty to correct him. Why, why is there the discrepancy? I think you do. You don't? Oh, the, could, could, pe could people in the room discuss? I, 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 I thought you did, um, but if I'm wrong about it, maybe others should discuss it. 
It, people think, uh, d d excuse me? I said that was an old example Professor Pittler used to give. That's, I don't know if, God rest his soul, I don't know if that's right then. Well, it, you know, I, I liked him too, but <laughs> um, the, maybe it's because the judge didn't ask you a question, the judge just made a statement, so you were just an overhearer. So you don't have an obligation as an overhearer to affirmatively correct, but if the judge said, isn't it, isn't, you know, isn't that right, then you would have to tell the truth. That's possible. I mean, I, it's possible that you would not get into ethical trouble for not correcting a false statement a judge made without his ask or her asking a question. I guess that is right. That's, that's terrible. Anything else? Well, I'm going to make, um, I, I'm, we're going to, if, if we're, any other questions? No, good, okay. And um, hope you found it interesting, and we'll see you upstairs for the reception. Thank you. Okay.